created. Let us pray, O God, or just instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost, grant us by the gift of the same Spirit that we may be truly wise and better rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. St. Pius X, St. Isidore, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. All right, so we continue with looking at the sacraments. Now that we finished the creed, we did a little bit of an introduction to the sacraments, and then uh, Father McBride spent a long time on baptism, because it's a huge chapter on baptism in the catechism. And so we're going to cover the next sacrament that's listed in the, uh, in the Catechism of the Council of Trent. And we might expect that that sacrament would be the Holy Eucharist, but, but it's not. It's the sacrament of confirmation. If you see a, a list of, of the sacraments, um, typically confirmation is after baptism and before the Eucharist. Um, even though chronologically, we would have received the Eucharist before we received confirmation. I think for the vast majority, is, is, is every, did everybody receive the Eucharist before confirmation? Or, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so um, it used to be the confirmation was received before the Holy Eucharist. But then when Pius X changed the age of the reception of the First Communion to right after you reach the age of reason, then Holy Eucharist went, went ahead of confirmation. Though in the um, Eastern Rites, they, they give confirmation at the same time as they give baptism. And um, I think, well, I, I read in the ritual that, that they, they've done that even in the, in the Latin Rite in some countries in the past. But be that as it may, um, we consider confirmation after baptism. So I just want to mention that next Tuesday is the Feast of the Assumption. So we won't we won't be having class next Tuesday. So the next class will be two weeks from today. Um, okay. So the, the Catechism, when it starts off its chapter on confirmation, it, it says that we really need to pay special attention to this sacrament because in our day, there are people who so neglect the sacrament, they don't even receive it. And in their day was the 1500s. This is the 1500s when they're, when they're writing this, this, this catechism. Uh, this is the catechism that came out of the Council of Trent. Um, do we know when the, the Council of Trent was held? 1530s? Uh, 1500s, wasn't it? 1500s, 1500s. Um, As a response to the Protestant Reformation? Yes, yeah, so 15... 45 to 1563, I think, something like that. So they're saying in the 1500s um, that some of the church are omitting to receive it, while among those who receive it, there are very few who seek to obtain from the sacrament the graces that they should. And us considering this sacrament of confirmation is a moment for us to remember that we are confirmed Catholics. And so that means we have an indelible mark on our soul. We, we receive the character of the sacrament of confirmation. You have two marks on your soul, two indelible marks, two characters on your soul from baptism and confirmation. And, and, the, and the mark on your soul is a power. Um, it gives you a capacity for the performance of supernatural acts. And specifically with confirmation, it gives you that power to profess the faith, to um, live the faith, <coughs> in the midst of a godless world. Well, in a sense, because our world is so secularized and there's so many tools the devil has today to shake our faith, and there's so much evil out there that's placed before our eyes um, that just being overwhelmed with evil, some people are shaken in their faith, we really need to draw upon in the strength of our confirmation, of the character of confirmation. Um, to believe that that we re have a grace of state as a Catholic. We have graces that come to us because we're Catholics that uh, make us capable of persevering in the faith and being strong in the faith in the midst of the temptations of this world. 
Okay, so let's talk about this sacrament. First of all, the word confirmation. Why is it called confirmation? This fly is driving me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. So, um, confirmation, uh, a lot of the words we use in theological terminology come directly from the Latin. They'll just transliterate the words. So, um, confirmare, confirmare in Latin is, is, is the, the word that's used when, when the sacrament is administrated. So, to confirm, we typically would say in English, we would confirm something, we would like, we assert it to be true. I'm confirming that I will be there on, on Wednesday, you know, that thing. I'm just saying that it's true that this is going to happen. But, but in, in Latin, um, to confirm means to strengthen, to make firm. Yeah. Got him. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I know. Got my spidey sense. <laughs> um, so... Um, to confirm, confirmare in Latin means to strengthen, to strengthen, to make firm. We call it confirmation because the soul is strengthened with a new power. The soul is stronger through the reception of the sacrament and is made complete. It's like the, the equipment of the soldier. We, we say there were, there's a second one. Uh, <laughs> so we say that, that uh, we're made a soldier of Christ. And you know how you have to equip the soldier so that the soldier has everything he needs so he can go into battle. And, and there's certain armament of the soldier. He may, he may have like his uniform, but he doesn't have his gun. He doesn't have his grenades, what have you. And he's not ready to go until he's fully equipped. And then he's, he's ready to go out and wage war against the enemy. So too for us, um, confirmation makes us fully equipped. We're, we're, we're now have all of our armaments, all of our, our stuff that we need to go out and wage battle with the world. All right, what about scripture? Is, <clears throat> is confirmation in scripture? Do we read about confirmation in scripture? Confirm the brethren. Firm the brethren. Well, there's some scenes in the Acts of the Apostles uh, that show the administration of the sacrament of confirmation. Two episodes that show that this sacrament is different from the sacrament of baptism. You know, people like the Protestants would say, oh, you know, um, there's, there's no distinct sacrament called confirmation. Um, they're just one in the same thing. Baptism and confirmation are one in the same thing. So in Acts chapter 8, the deacon Philip had preached the gospel in Samaria and had administered baptism. But he's like, I can't do everything here. Uh, he got away. I can't do everything I, uh, to, to do the rest, I need to go get the, the leaders of the church. So he fetches Peter and John. You notice that Peter and John, they seem to have a special friendship. They're often together, Peter and John, They're the ones who run the tomb together, right? They're, they're also together in the boat with others. And John 20, 21, when our Lord tells them to cast and catch, catch the fish, so they're together here as well. Um, they go to complete the work begun by Philip. And so what they do is they, they impose hands on these people who have already been baptized. They've already been baptized, but Peter and John, these, these uh, special representatives from, from the church, come and impose hands on the baptized. And um, there are wonderful miracles that follow upon this. There's... there's a manifestation that these people receive the Holy Ghost. And everybody's like, oh, wow. Um, then Simon Magus is envious of the apostles' power. Simon, Simon Magus is a magician. He's, he's like, wow, this is incredible. And he goes to Peter and he says, hey, I've got a lot of money. Um, can you give me this power? 
if I pay you, mm. and that's where we get the word semini, right? Get the word semini, where you attempt to buy holy things. It comes from Simon Magus, who tried to buy the power to, to cause the Holy Ghost to come upon people, right? It's like purchasing ordination, buying ordination. You call 1-800-impose-hands, and they're just like, okay, <laughs> we will ordain you for the price of, you know, 5,000 bucks or whatever. Um, then over 20 years later, St. Paul is in Ephesus, which was evangelized by Apollo. And when he gets there, you know, Apollo was someone who wanted to uh, preach our Lord, but didn't really know the gospel. He was a good preacher, but he didn't really know what he was saying. He didn't have the whole full gospel. So St. Paul gets there and he says, did you receive the Holy Ghost? when you became believers. And the reply they gave to St. Paul was, we've never even heard there is a Holy Ghost. We don't know what that is, the Holy Ghost. And he's like, well, I guess you probably haven't received them. So they had only received the baptism of John. So St. Paul has them baptized and then he imposes hands upon them, clearly two distinct rites. Um, he performed the same rite that St. Peter and St. John performed in chapter 8. So this is in chapter 19. And the Holy Ghost manifested himself in the same way as he did in Samaria. So there's these two clear episodes from the Acts of the Apostles that show distinct rites for baptism and this reception of the Holy Ghost, showing the Apostles or treating confirmation as a separate sacrament with a separate rite from baptism. There are other quotations from St. Paul where it seems like he is referring to the sacrament of confirmation. In Ephesians chapter 4, he says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed. And the Father's talking about what it was meant by sealing. And they, they come up with this notion of the mark, that you're marked by the sacraments of baptism and confirmation. And that in confirmation, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. Then in Romans 5, he says, The charity of God is poured forth in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, who is given to us. And... They think that that is also a reference to confirmation, the giving of the Holy Ghost in confirmation. Um, meanwhile, the fathers of the church spoke of confirmation. There's plenty, there's plenty of the fathers of the church who spoke of confirmation, and they considered it a distinct sacrament from baptism. So it is its own sacrament from the beginning of the church. Okay, why? why? Why is there a distinct sacrament? Why is there, there a separate sacrament from baptism? Confirmation, why, why, do we, why do we need this other sacrament? Why isn't baptism enough? I mean, doesn't baptism give you supernatural life? And then you have the state of grace? Then you're able to go to heaven, right? And you receive baptism? So you're good to go, right? You're good to go. The effects of sin are still there. They have to be fought against. Mm -hmm. Just as if, um, so you need more strength and maturity. You need more strength and maturity. Yeah, so we always, um, when, when St. Thomas tries to justify the existence of a sacrament, he relates it to our natural life. And he, uh, he says, just as in our natural life, there's a time for your birth. That's when you come into life. But there's something distinct, and that is your growth in life. You, the day of your birth is, is, is distinct from, from the day of you growing up, the days of you growing up. So just as there are two different things that happen for you to be born and for you to grow up in the natural life, so too in the supernatural life, there are two different sacraments for you being born into the supernatural life and for you growing up to become an adult in the supernatural life. So confirmation 
He is the sacrament which makes us grow to full maturity. It makes us an adult. So once, once you're, you're baptized, you have supernatural, you're alive. I'm now alive, but I'm still not fully grown. And so I need another sacrament after baptism because I can't get baptized again. I need another sacrament to bring me to the full maturity of the spiritual life, and that is confirmation. So St. Thomas, he always says, whenever there is a special effect of grace pertaining to the supernatural life of the soul, there is a distinct sacrament. So when you have a special effect of grace pertaining to the supernatural life of the soul, you need a distinct sacrament to give that grace. So when you have this special effect, the special effect is being born into supernatural life is one effect. And another effect is growing to adulthood. In the supernatural life. So those are two distinct supernatural effects in the soul. Two distinct things that happen. It's different to be born into supernatural life and to come to full maturity in supernatural life. They're two different things, just as they are in our natural life. It's very different the day of my birth from the day when I become an adult. So this is, this is the argument. You, you need, a, this is why our Lord instituted a, a different sacrament, two different sacraments, to give these two distinct types of graces. So um, baptism brings one into supernatural life. Confirmation gives one to grow to full maturity in that life. Baptism forms the mind unto faith. Confirmation equips a per person to profess that faith. A special help is needed such that a person be deterred by no danger in the profession of the faith. So there's no longer, um, not going to be derailed by any of the dangers in professing the faith. The Catechism quotes Pope Nakiades. I'm just going to put his name up here. Pope Melchiades has a beautiful paragraph comparing these two sacraments, indicating their difference. He says, In baptism, man is enlisted into the service. In confirmation, he is equipped for battle. A military analogy. At the baptismal font, the Holy Ghost imparts fullness to accomplish innocence, but in confirmation, he ministers perfection to grace. In baptism, we are regenerated unto life. After baptism, confirmation, we are fortified for the combat. In baptism, we are cleansed. After baptism, we are strengthened. Regeneration of itself saves those who receive baptism in time of peace. Confirmation arms and makes ready for conflicts. I think that's pretty clear. 
the difference between those two sacraments, baptism and confirmation. They do two different things. They give two different types of graces. Oh, no. I was right. Two different sacraments for two different effects. All right, when was this sacrament instituted? All seven sacraments are instituted by our Lord. When was confirmation instituted? We don't know. We don't know. It's not, it's not in the Gospels. There's no time that we can point to we can say that was the day that our lord instituted the sacrament of confirmation so the common opinion is that it was instituted sometime in the 40 days before the ascension the time when our lord was risen from the dead you know on easter sunday he instituted the sacrament of confession but we don't know. According to Pope St. Fabian, you know, St. Fabian and Sebastian have their feast day together in the month of February, I think. Um, our Lord instituted even the rite of chrism and the words used in the sacrament. That's, that was the opinion of Pope St. Fabian. Um, we should note that some of the sacraments had a shadow or a rite that corresponded to them in the Old Testament. Like for the Eucharist, there's, there's for the Mass, there's, there's the Passover meal, right? It's kind of a foreshadowing of the sacrifice of our Lord, the Paschal Lamb being slain and being eaten by the people, right? It's a symbol of uh, a faint symbol of the Mass. Baptism. Uh, you had there. There was there was circumcision. There was the the people of Israel passing through the Red Sea, it being saved through the waters, or Noah's Ark being saved um, on the waters. So there is no Old Testament equivalent to confirmation. And the reason why uh, the the spiritual authors think that there's no equivalent of confirmation is because confirmation brings you to the perfection of the Christian life. And the Old Testament was not able to do anything to perfection. It was not able to have perfect sacrifices, not able to have perfect sacraments. So there's, there's no sacrament that like bring you to perfection as such. So confirmation is a, is a sacrament that's wholly new. Um, it has no equivalent in the Old Testament. Okay. What... Um, what are the elements of this sacrament? What are the matter <clears throat> and the form of confirmation? Um, confirmations, I'm just gonna write it right in front of myself so nobody can see this. <laughs> um, and then I'm gonna stand right here and teach you. <laughs> Head position. So, what are the what are the elements of confirmation? You know, there's there's matter and form of all the sacraments. And we even distinguish like remote matter, proximate matter. I don't think this the catechism talks about the proximate matter, but What's the matter? Chrism, the, chrism. the chrism. Chrism. Remote matter is chrism. What is chrism? Specific oil. Yes. Yeah. It's chrism is, is made up of two things. Two things. Olive oil and balsam. 
Why were those two put together? Well, that's a good question. It's a good question. Um, so the oil, as you know, is used in many sacraments, but oil is a symbol of grace. Oil diffuses itself. It's, it spreads itself. Um, so the catechism talks about the suitability of the oil. If this sacrament is to give you the fullness of the Holy Ghost, and, and oil diffuses itself, it spreads to all parts. Um, it says, in the sacrament, the fullness of the Holy Ghost is given so that the confirmed may communicate his actions to others. Oil, by its nature, rich, unctuous, and fluid expresses the fullness of grace, which through the Holy Ghost overflows and is poured into others from Christ the head, like the ointment that ran down the beard of Aaron. So it's the symbol of the grace is like running down you and like spreading, spreading everywhere. <laughs> so you get you get like the fullness, the fullness of, of grace through the oil. Um let me just pause on this oil for a bit. You know, there's there's big con controversy with the oil um, because in 1972, Paul VI issued a decree, Sacrum Unctionum, and in this decree he said basically up to this point, olive oil, specific type of oil, has been required for the validity of the sacrament of confirmation but now we will allow the use of any oil like vegetable oil any 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 vegetable oil can be used for confirmation some were worried that whether the pope even had the power to do this why because of the fact that the sacraments are instituted by our lord and the, the elements of our faith that are instituted by him are the divine elements of the faith. Whereas the elements that come from churchmen, from mere churchmen, are human elements. The human elements can be changed. If they're made by men, they can be remade by men and changed by men. But if they're made by our Lord, the divine elements, then they cannot be changed. You cannot change what, what God has established, right? You, if, if marriage is, is such, then you can't. If divorce is not permitted, divorce is not permitted. If that comes from our Lord, you can't rewrite the gospel. It's like, okay, well, this is what our Lord said back then. I'm going to do a new sermon on the mount, and we're going to change what he said because um, it's the 21st century, and we're modern men. So um, you, you can't do that. So if, if our Lord actually instituted this sacrament to use olive oil, and you can't change that, you can't change that. And I mean, um, certainly the, the apostles and our Lord would not have been thinking of any other oil. And that was, that was just when people said oil back then, it was olive oil. Um, and you go to the Holy Land, there's olive trees, right? Um, it's the, the Garden of Gethsemane. Our Lord is in the, in the press, you know, there's the olive trees there. Um, there's a symbol of him being, being pressed by, by the sins of mankind. So, um, I don't know. I don't know. The, uh, all the fathers of the church, all theologians agreed on olive oil, um, but Paul VI changed it in 1972. So, olive oil is the oil par excellence, and it takes on the generic name of oil because of its excellence. Um, the olive tree, being an evergreen, signifies the refreshing and merciful operation of the Holy Ghost, where the soul is, is always um, flourishing through the oil of the sacrament. So we said the other element that's put in there is balsam. Balsam. And balsam is known especially for its fragrant odor. When um, I was in the seminary, I was in the sacristy, and, <laughs> and um, I, I had to 
prepare the oils uh, for the ceremony, for the chrismal mass. So the, these oils are consecrated at the chrismal mass by the bishop on Holy Thursday. And we had to open these containers of balsam, and it's the sweetest smelling stuff I've ever smelled. Like of all the things I've ever, ever smelled, it's, it's like sweeter than, than any flower. Um, it's amazing. It's, amazing. it's an amazing sweet smell. So the balsam is a symbol of the fragrant odor that um, Catholics are meant to spread about them. Um, yeah, <laughs> they're supposed to be sweet smelling. Um, not not through their cologne, but but uh, through their good works. Since now, after their death, they still smell good. Yes, yes. Some of the saints um, literally had a good odor. Yeah, no, literally. Uh, Padre Pio, for instance. Uh, and sometimes you can smell the gloves of Padre Pio, and they still have a nice scent to them. Okay, Rue de Bac. Yeah, Rue de Bac. And it is a, uh, it's an old-fashioned French expression that people don't use in all the secularized, so people don't even understand them. Say, odor de sainteté is not in odor de sainteté, which means it doesn't have the favor of someone anymore. Which, you mean odor, you mean odor, odor, odor of sainthood. So when you're sent, you smell, there's a special smell around you. Yes. Uh, well, there's even a scriptural expression. I mean, it's St. Paul uses this expression um, of, of having the good odor. It, yeah. Have the good smell. Uh, you good got the, smell. the nice smells. <laughs> um, so people can smell you're a Christian just uh, <laughs> by, your, by your good odor. Um. Yeah, and it goes with the fact that the flesh is intact. Of the, the, the sense. Yes. So when yeah. You open the cup in, uh, yeah. It's two. Yeah. It's two for me. Yes. In the odor of sanctity. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not and that's not a literal odor. It's it's their works conveyed to people that they were holy. That's what we mean. They died in the odor of sanctity. That the, that the way they acted conveyed to people that they were holy. Yeah. So St. Paul, he loves these earthy expressions. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, we are the good odor of Christ. We are the smell of Christ. That's what we project. And people see us, they, they see and smell our Lord. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have to know <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, you smell like <laughs> smell like God. Um, <laughs> um, so also balsam confers incorruptibility. So if you mix balsam with um, something, it's not going to go bad. <clears throat> the balsam is probably not necessary for the validity validity of the sacrament. There's no certainty about that. Okay, so those are the elements of the sacrament. Wait a second. <clears throat> Before we go to the form, we have to talk a little bit more about the chrism. And you know, the chrism is only blessed by the bishop. Why is it that, well, the, the, rather, the question that the catechism asks is the following. Why is the matter for this sacrament blessed before it's used? Like the, the matter for um, the Eucharist is not blessed. We just take the wine out of the bottles, and we just take the host out of the boxes, and we put them on the chalice, we put the, we put the wine in the cruets, but we don't bless them before the Mass, right? So... Why is it that with the chrism, the, the um, matter is blessed before it's used in the sacrament? Well, the, uh, the reason they give is that <clears throat> for the sacraments of baptism and the Holy Eucharist, our Lord did those sacraments when he was here on this earth.
And so our Lord, by performing these sacraments, or in the case of baptism, receiving baptism, in the case of the Holy Eucharist, or forming the Mass, He sanctified the matter for all time. By being baptized in the, water, in, in the River Jordan, He sanctified water and made water apt for baptizing. And when he, at the Last Supper, he, he gave Holy Communion at the Last Supper, He sanctified bread and wine making them apt for the performance of those sacraments. However, he never, we do not read about him sanctifying oil. So he's leaving that to the bishops to sanctify the matter before. We're not saying that the matter doesn't need to be sanctified, but we're saying it's already sanctified by our Lord when he walked this earth and he had contact with water, bread, and wine. Um, Christ did not bless oils, nor was he anointed, because he himself is the anointed. So his, his name, Christ, means the anointed one, Christus, Christus. So you have chrism is, is the oil, and Christus is the one anointed by the oil. That's the reason it's given um, why we sanctify the matter before the performance of the sacrament for confirmation we do not do that for baptism or the holy eucharist all right um <clears throat> let's talk about the form of the sacrament <clears throat> what is the form of the sacrament of confirmation in the traditional rite words spoken Yes. What, what are the words? Now the bishop imposes his hand, one hand, right? And makes the sign of the cross and then does this and then does that, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's, I can confirm what take chrism takes, I, I confirm you with the chrism of salvation. Um, and I sign you with the sign of the cross in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. That's the form. And we're going to talk about the appropriateness of this form. The form is meant to give a specification to the sacraments, it gives a signification. What are we doing here? What is, what is this rite all about? What is happening? You know that all the sacraments are signs, and they're signs that cause. How do they cause? Through the signification. God is attached to the signification, a certain causality, such that grace will be caused when you're making the sign. So we have to signify something. We have to signify the giving of supernatural grace. And the main signification, the heavy lifting on the signification, is not by the matter. It's by the form. The form does more signification than the matter because our words are more precise than the matter is. Like our words, I baptize you, is more precise than pouring of water on somebody. And there could be many reasons why I'm pouring water, right? Could be. Cleaning them, could be cooling them down, right? Um, could be putting out fire in their hair, who knows? So when I say I baptize, I indicate clearly what I am doing with this water, what is signified by the pouring of the water. It's a supernatural washing that's taking place. So too in confirmation, signing the forehead with the oils, you know, imposing the hands, signing the forehead with the with the oil, could mean many things, could signify many things. And it's the words that tell us what the signification is. So the words, um, the form contains the three things necessary for the essence of the sacrament. So confirmation, is the giving of the Holy Ghost to 
to strengthen the one receiving the sacrament. And so we need to signify that this is what we're doing when we say the words. St. Thomas says there are three different things. There's the cause, the cause of the strengthening, the spiritual strength given, and a sign given to the combatant. All right, so what is the cause of the strengthening? It's a sacrament, but cause is God, right? God, God's going to give us the strength. So we, the cause is the blessed trinity. And the words are... Nomine Patris, et Fili, et Spiritus Sancti. The bishop says, Confirmo te chrisma te salutis, et consigno te signo salutis, Nomine Patris, et Fili, et Spiritus Sancti. He makes the sign of the cross. Then the spiritual strength given is indicated by Confirmo te. Prismate salutis. I confirm you with the chrism of salvation. The sign is Signo te, Signo crucis. So the form indicates signifies three things the cause of the strengthening the strengthening itself the spiritual strength given and a a sign to the soldier the sign of the cross and for these reasons saint thomas says this is appropriate the words of the sacrament are appropriate um the form is appropriate <clears throat> saint thomas says that this form is received from tradition. But studies indicate it's no older than the 12th century. And before that time, <laughs> other forms were in use, other formulas. We say the form, we're saying the formula that you use. According to Amularius of Metz, who died in the 9th century, the Latin church had no uniform formula of confirmation in the 9th century. So there's a lot of different words that were used in the conferral of the sacrament back in the ninth century. The same may be said of the Eastern churches, with the sole exception of the Greek, which has employed its present formula ever since the sixth century. So the Greeks have been the most consistent from the 500s till now, they've used the same formula, whereas the Latins were not too consistent. However, this form was confirmed, no pun intended, by the Council of Florence. So, yeah, this form was confirmed by the Council of Florence in, anybody know when? Sixth century? No. No, not 6th century. Not 9th. Um, yeah, 1439. 1439, yeah. It's when, <laughs> it's when that council happened. So it mentions the form for confirmation. Um, the blow on the cheek 
did not become customary until the 12th century, the Middle Ages. It was apparently devised the imitation of the blow by which knighthood was conferred in the Middle Ages. You, can, you become a knight, and you receive a blow, you know, to indicate that, hey, be tough. You're going to have to go fight. Yeah, be a tough guy. Um, so, so there you have it. I um, thought we might just talk briefly about the right of confirmation, how it takes place. We saw it here earlier this year. Bishop TCA was here, right? Um, I don't know if all of you are here for that, but um, I don't think soldier of Christ is even a term that they use in those order. I don't think my children had ever heard of that term mm -hmm. when they were confirmed until, you know, I, I said something to them because, you know, that's something that you remember from your confirmation. Right. They were more concerned with doing community service. That's That was their focus. Yeah, it's like a coming of age where you do... Charitable works. Yeah, and it's like it's not a supernatural thing. So you know, I always wonder if my, my children were actually confirmed. I mean, I mean, I know that I had checked to see if they used olive oil, and they did. Yeah. But, well, I mean, um, faith. <laughs> you know, um, integral faith is not necessary for the validity of, of a sacrament. But if they follow the right of the church. We assume it's valid, and they they use the olive oil, uh, even though, you know, it was it was naturalistic. Yeah. So, um, one of the things that happens during the confirmation ceremony is the singing of uh, a verse from one of the psalms. Confirma o Deus coro poratu sese nobis a templo sancto tuo coras in Jerusalem. Strengthen this, O God, the thing that you have done in us from your holy temple, which is in Jerusalem. Strengthen this. And there's this is the chant that is sung at that time. Um, so you hear the Gregorian chant. Uh, this is which, which is in the Liber Usualis. If for those with the scola, and they're there at the confirmation ceremony, and then you will hear the polyphonic version, which I think our choir sang on, on that day of confirmation. <laughs> it's Gregorian chant part. <laughs> ceremony 
that is sermon by me. Um, maybe we can watch me giving catechism. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so that was in May, Feast of the Ascension. Okay, so first, there's the singing of the Veni Creator. Um, Veni Creator Spiritus. And then the bishop, he gives a sermon. And then after he gives the sermon, he goes up um, and he faces the candidates having his hands joined. The candidates kneel, have their hands folded, so they're in the pews, right? They still haven't come up. And he says, may the Holy Spirit come down upon you. May the power of the Most High keep you from sin. Oh, they're going to... Uh, Bishop's uh, giving some directions. <laughs> so he, he then um, says, Ajitoyim nostrum nomine domine, domine exaudi ratio nomeum, dominus vobiscum. And he extends his hands over the, the ones to be confirmed. So they're in their pews, and he, he extends his hands outward over them. And he pronounces this prayer. Almighty, everlasting God, who has deigned to beget new life in these servants by water and the Holy Spirit, has granted them remission of all their sins. Send forth from heaven upon them the Holy Ghost, the Consoler, with his sevenfold gifts. So that's what he sings now. So you see, extends his hands. So then he goes through um, the gifts of the Holy Ghost. He says, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and fortitude, the spirit of knowledge and of piety. And then he says, you notice there was six, that was six gifts, that wasn't seven. Like what, I think there's seven, right? And he's, he's gonna say it's another one. So then, then he goes on to say, fill them with the spirit of the fear of the Lord, the last gift, and seal them with the sign of Christ's cross. He makes the sign of the cross. Plenteous in mercy unto life everlasting through the self same Jesus Christ, the Son our Lord, who lives and reigns with thee in the unity of the same Holy Ghost, God forever and ever. In vita propitiatus et verium de nominum nostrum Iesum Christum Filio Tuus. Fide convivit de regnat in unitate Iusus et Spiritus Sancti Deus, et omnia secula seculo. Okay, so that's for everybody. And it's at that point, the people start to come out of their pews. They come up one by one. And they kneel before the bishop, right? And they have the, the card with the with their confirmation name on it. Um, and when he when they come up, he he imposes his hands and says, "Confirmate chrismate salutis." He dips his finger in the chrism. He signs them on, on the forehead. Confirmate chrismate salutis. Signor says, "Signor crucis." Nomine patris et filii spiritus sancti. And then slap. And so that's that's what 
happens um, for each person. And that's the point when they are actually confirmed. This is maybe the first one. Can't really see what's going on. So at the end, um, they say the Apostles' Creed. A after they all go back, the, um, the, the bishop has a one last prayer. And he says, O God, thou didst give the Holy Ghost to thine apostles, and this will that he should be handed down through them and their successors upon the rest of the faithful. So now behold with favor our lowly ministration, and grant that the same Holy Ghost may come and abide in the hearts of them whose brow we have anointed with holy chrism and sealed with the sign of the Holy Cross. And by his indwelling, may he graciously cause them to become a perfect temple for his divine majesty. And then he turns to the confirmed and he blesses them. Um, From Sion, hence, may the Lord send you his blessing so that all your days you may gaze upon the prosperity of Jerusalem and may, may come to possess everlasting life. And then they, uh, they pray Apostles' Creed together. So um, next week we will look at the rest of the elements of the, of the Sacrament of Confirmation, um, the minister, the subject, and the effects. But that's all for today. That'll be two weeks from now. And we'll say, say a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Lady, help of Christians. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. You're welcome. I'm going to talk to you. I mean,